All right, everybody. Hey, hello, Michael McGinnis here. Today, we're going to jump right into a story, an inspired story with Richard. And we see Tom here, alias Santa Cares. You know, myself will be jumping in as appropriate. So without further ado, Richard, let's, let's go. Thank you. This story has been on my mind a lot over the past year. Uh, and things have come up about it that I think are important to try and get out to the public at large. Uh, what I've been writing it up in a, in a, for a book, so I'm going to try and remember what I've written, remember the story, and not the exact way I've written it. So we're, we'll, I'll stumble through here. There was an, an event that occurred in 1401 in Italy that that event was uh, considered very miraculous. And Tom came to know of it in the, somewhere in the 1980s. He lived with, he lived, he worked with a guy named Rudy, I've forgotten his last name, but Tom and his wife Elaine were good friends with Rudy and Rudy's wife Carmine. They would often go over to visit them back and forth. At one point, there were Rudy and Carmine had nieces coming over from Italy to visit America, see America, visit with people, all that stuff. And they brought a bunch of pictures and postcards with them. Elaine and Tom got invite, invited over to come and see, and, and Rudy and, and uh, Carmine were translating. And they're going through the pictures, this, that, and other thing, explaining where this was. One of the postcards was more of a line drawing than a photograph like somebody had taken a photograph and then just traced the outlines of things uh like a pencil drawing so and it caught tom's attention and he wanted to know if it's real he picks it up and he holds it up and he says is this real rudy translates and the young girls laugh he doesn't quite know what to make of that he he points again is this a real thing? Rudy translates and they laugh again. This is a highlight of the evening for these girls. What caught Tom's attention was the inscription above the doorway of a church. And when he saw that description, he suddenly came to an awareness of the ancient history of the church from 1401. And a young girl who uh, according to Wikipedia, her name is Agnes. But he came to know of it in a flash, just sitting there with um, Rudy and Carmine. The girls thought they were asking, is the house behind the church, which they lived in, is that a real th house? That's why they're, they're laughing. You, do you live in a real house? But he wants to know, it, did someone just throw this... Um, inscription in there because it sounded good or was it a real thing he wanted validation of what he had just came come to know just come to be aware of so the story is in 1401 this young girl agnes uh she was deaf <clears throat> um and a deaf girl in a village in those years would have a very very difficult life she couldn't be married off would be Excuse me, very hard to find someone who would want to marry her. So she was kind of a, a, a burden on her parents. Seen as a burden, treated more as a slave than as a daughter. The common thing at the time, they were living at the foot of Mount Taberno, and to, the, every summer they would take the sheep up to the higher pastures to graze. They would have to come down for the winter and whatnot. But when they were up there, someone would have to stay with them. In 1401, Agnes was old enough to stay up there, stay with the sheep, watch over them, and be given a stern warning. She was to be spinning wool while she's there, not just dreamily gazing at the sheep as they grazed. This was... This was hard for Tom to explain. He kept having emotional responses because he was connecting to 
how difficult her life was, how she was treated as a worker, just an unpaid worker. And Tom knew her to be a diligent, hard worker, and also spiritually very innocent, very pure. So while she's up there spinning away at the at her wheel, the new station alert has arrived. Sorry. Right. Well, you got it. Yep. <laughs> okay. There's a snowstorm coming. I've got the hints of it behind me here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So while she's up there spinning at her wheel, a uh, she had a vision of the Madonna. The mother Mary came to her and told her to go down to the village and get all the people to come up the mountain that the Madonna had something to tell them. Well, little Agnes, she, the first thing that occurs to her is, I'll get a beating if I don't finish tr uh, spinning this yarn. And she was reassured taking her up. The next thing that comes to her mind is, I can't talk. How am I going to tell him anything? Again, she was reassured that'll all that'll be taken care of. And she, she says, "Well, I can't hear anything either. I have no idea how to respond to them." Mother Mary, mother, not Mother Miriam, Mother Mary, said, "Go. It'll all be taken care of. Just go." So down the the mountain she ran. Run. It's a so the heights of the mount. Full height of the mountain is. 4,500, over 4,500 feet. She's not quite that tall, not quite that high up, but there's more of the mountain yet to go, but it's still a few thousand feet vertical down to where the, the village is. She gets there and first runs right to the priest, which, who's the authority in any Italian town of that era. And she runs up to him yelling, Dad, fa father, father, the Madonna, I saw the Madonna. She wants us to come up the mountain. She has something to tell us. And his reply is, Agnes, you can speak. And she goes, yes, yes, I can speak. But the Madonna, the Madonna wants to tell us something. He goes, and you can hear too. Yes, I can speak and I can hear. The Madonna, the Madonna wants to tell us something. And the priest goes, Agnes, this is a miracle. We must go tell your father. Takes her by the hand and off they go. <laughs> they don't immediately go up the hill. So it takes, so this, the word spreads around that she can speak, she can hear, people want to see it for themselves, they want to talk to her. It's getting around about all, this whole thing. Some people are a little skeptical yet. There's always a few, you know, doubters and malcontents in any l group, large enough group of people. So it takes actually for the entire village to go up the mountain it takes three days to prepare and start moving and finally arrive at the top of the mountain we got to take food and water and all that kind of stuff so when they get there the villagers level of receptivity is a little bit reduced because of the complaining the arrangements that had to be made, the difficulty of the trip, they weren't quite as open uh, and with that sense of wonder that you might have, uh, that you would tend to, anyone would tend to have in a spiritually, um, what do they call it now, uh, spiritually transformative experience. They were a little reduced from that. So when they got there, they weren't receptive enough to see the Madonna. There were a couple little hints here and there of, oh, I see something, you know, oh, I think I feel something. Not much is coming of it. They mill around, they're, they grumble a little bit. They decide, well, this is, you know, what happened happened. Oh, and they found yarn all over the place, more yarn than could have been spun in the amount of time it took to get back up there. So Agnes didn't get her beating. She can hear, she can speak, and she did not get a beating. Got, so they got three miracles right there. They decided that's it. Nothing more is going to happen. They start to head down the mountain when somebody saw a glint of light coming through a crack in the rock wall. 
This was apparently just a solid rock wall with a, a crack in the center and just enough of a visual glint of light was coming out of there to tell that it wasn't something just right here, but something far back inside the, the rock. That prompted them to, well, chip away a little bit, see what this is. They picked up whatever was lying around to, to chip away at this rock. Once they got it opened up enough that they could see in there, it was clear that there was a very lar fairly large cavern inside what they had appeared to be a solid rock wall. So a few of the young guys run down to the village, grab some tools, come back up. And in a little while, they got a hole big enough so one of the smaller adults male adults could make it inside he had this he was in there for a minute or two letting his eyes adjust and by the time he could see in that dim light he started ranting and raving so fiercely they thought he'd gone mad so suddenly there's tons of activity and they open enough so other people can get in they get inside and they find a statue a statue of the madonna seated holding the christ child in her left arm and in her right hand i'll hold my hands up in her right hand are three spheres too large to stay in her hand by themselves you know if you had if you had three apples maybe you can hold them but if you got three grapefruits or softballs it's too big and you can't hold them they need to be glued together to stay in her hand so they found that in the center of this opening. On the back wall behind her is a painting of the village as it looked on that day in 1401. And above that painting was a uh, inscription in Latin. So this is a giant miracle. This is amazing. They they bring they get the statue out, they they open it up. That picture is now's the time to show that picture, Mike. That's it. They open it up enough so they can get the statue out of there. You can see a little bit of the painting left on the back wall yet. You can't quite make out in this, the inscription above it, but a little bit off to the right as we're looking at it, there's a now a painting leaning against the wall down on the floor, that's it, of the statue in its prime. The statue is uh, deteriorated a bit now, and people have taken relics of the wooden chair and whatnot. Uh, but that statue at that time so soon was carried down to the village where they built uh, a large church around it. This was a uh, miraculous thing. The, I can't remember. If you look up like the Madonna of Mount Taberno on Wikipedia, you'll see this picture <clears throat> and more information about the, the, the church. So the, the inscription that's above the, the painting in, on, in, yes, in the grotto was duplicated above the door of the church down in the town and was on that postcard that Tom had picked up, the line drawing postcard. The inscription today in modern times is translated from the Latin as these three spheres stand for the disasters that can befall mountainous areas, the, the natural disasters, fire, earthquakes, landslides, um, and and it's translated the meaning is interpreted as pray the rosary and say our, our father so many times a day or god will release one of these spheres upon you it is sadly interpreted as a threat from god tom says that's not the intention of the the original uh, artist who drew this who knows how many hundreds of years previously, and the natural shearing and compression forces of the mountain closed it in. So the original meaning, according to Tom, is 
that these are the natural influences that the earth has to go through. You can't stop them from happening. But the glue that holds them together is human spirituality, basic human compassion. And Tom says there needs to be a minimum level. You need to maintain a minimum level of this spiritual glue, of this human compassion, in order for these uh, natural disasters to stay within, uh, I don't want to say acceptable limits, but if you if we don't maintain spirit, uh, the spiritual glue, then it starts to come apart. And we could have, you know, horrendous, extra po powerful and numerous hurricanes. We could have wildfires. We can have even lava flows erupting in suburban areas of Hawaii, which has happened. Tom Gate told this story throughout the 80s and 90s as a warning, as a as a teaching more than a warning that don't let your your human compassion fall below some unspecified minimum level what he's talking about is the earth hum, humanity at large if people just basic people fall below this level of spiritual glue the earth we can uh, become an irritant to Mother Earth. The same way that we are not aware of the mites that live on our eyelashes, the Earth is not aware of us. But if the mites, something the mites are doing, causes an irritation, we'll put a salve on it or go to the doctor and get something done to take care of it. If we, as humanity at large, become an irritation on the surface of Mother Earth, she may shrug her shoulders to relieve her discomfort. And that will be seen in the form of these natural disasters, the storms, the hurricanes, the earthquakes, the like earthquakes in Oklahoma, for crying out loud, uh, the tsunami, the 2004 tsunami in the Indian Ocean. It, it was devastating to millions of people but somehow there were aboriginal islanders there are a few indonesian islands that have been left alone they don't want whenever western civilization shows up they clearly don't want you there and for somehow they have been left alone throughout all these years people will fly over them once in a while with a, a, a helicopter count how many come out to, to shoot arrows at the helicopter and that's how they tell if they're doing okay well after the tsunami there was just as many uh of these aboriginal people come out as before the tsunami they had as tom explains they maintained a spiritual compassionate connection to the earth they don't see themselves as owners of the earth entitled to extract its resources for personal profit. They see themselves as shepherds of the earth, that they live with the earth. And it may, their ability to survive the tsunami may have been just as simple as the chief or shaman, whatever the leader of the tribe may have been, intuitively decided well, we should pick the uh, the fruit that grows up on the, the you know, higher up the mountain this today. So when the tsunami came through, the villagers were all up there. And it was just an intuitive decision, not a not necessarily a knowing, well, oh, there, there's going to be a tsunami. We all we all got to get away from the shore. That kind of connection to the earth is what allowed the Tibetans uh, let's see, the Tibetan culture, Tibetan nation, is the only culture on earth to have 
changed in, in recorded history to a change from a warrior culture to a peace loving culture. At the time that the teachings of the Buddha arrived in Tibet, they were a, they had a fierce warrior reputation. But yet, they still maintained a shepherd, shepherd's view of the earth, not the owners of the earth. That while they used metal objects, they, they had metallurgy, they didn't like pulling metal out of the earth to use it. That was, that was frowned upon, even though it was useful. So the concept of the earth belongs to me, I can take anything I want out of it and use it for myself. And because it's mine, I can do that. There, that sense of being a shepherd, that there are more yet to live beyond you, that we're counting on how well you take care of the earth. That was the universally compassionate foundation that the teachings of the Buddha could build upon to change them from a warrior culture to a peace loving culture. That leaves the question, what do we have as a Western modern world as a universally compassionate foundation upon which to start building a more peaceful attitude toward each other, toward the earth, toward the earth, uh, a more spiritual way of life. That's been hard to find. I've been kind of searching for it ever since Tom told this story the first time. I heard it in the early 90s, I guess. So 30 years I've been wondering, where where is that commonality? Where's that thing that everybody agrees on and can it heartfeltly agrees on and can move forward from, can use that as a, uh, as a building foundation. And then COVID hit. And here we have a worldwide pandemic taking out hundreds of thousands of people in the United States alone, many more around the globe. It is truly a global phenomenon Perhaps, and I can only say perhaps, because there are still people with their heads full of thoughts rather than their hearts on seeing the human devastation of this disease. I hope that it soon that occurs. And the old comment about if you don't learn your lesson, it comes back again harder. Could that be what these more contagious variants are? We didn't think we've had this, we've had this COVID for a whole year and there's still people going, ha, 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 and they're not gonna, and they aren't, you know, their heads are just full of thoughts about stuff, nonsense, I'm gonna say. I'll just put it all under the heading of nonsense because it's not really human compassion from the heart. So are these variants an enhancement of the lesson, making it more difficult? It can be seen that way. And remembering uh, uh, during a talk Tom gave one time, excuse me, back in the early 90s, someone asked Tom, if he thought, if he felt that AIDS was going to be, was going to wipe out humanity, to, if, to simplify the question, is AIDS going to wipe out humanity? Tom rephrased the question. He stated it as, is AIDS going to be the disease that wipes out three quarters of the population of the earth, leaving only spiritual people be still alive and he said no i don't see aids being that but what we're looking at now covid could fit that it, i can't say that it is i don't know a lot depends on what we do 
as compassionate human beings to help take care of each other. We're doing these Zoom meetings. We you wear masks. You see people saying not to wear masks. You see people gathering together in big groups for whatever they're doing. But the basic compassion of, gee, this, this could hurt someone. I'll be careful with me for their good is not spread enough yet. It isn't, hasn't reached what I want to call the saturation point of at least our nation that I would like to see it have. And with that, I have to wonder if something like COVID isn't going to bring people out to understand our place in the world, that we have to work with each other and we'd be better off work living with the earth rather than taking from it. If this doesn't do it, what will? That's my story. That's my question. Well, Richard, just thank you very much for your willingness and promptness to uh, speak out about it. I learned a lot. I recall pieces of the story, but nowhere is near the depth of which you uh, shared it with respect to the, the statue and story or is there and what's really profound is, is how you relate that to current times. And I know I deeply felt that, and Tom would be curious, your thoughts too, is my own is, is I, I, I wrote not long ago, um, a few months into the pandemic, is, is that this is nothing less than a wake up call to all of humanity. And, and I believe that and I still see it and I'm seeing a lot of implications from this. Um, but you're right, is, is that, you know, what's this element of compassion, you know, that's there. I, I, I see that prevailing attitudes and of not wearing masks and who really cares. And, you know, just, I, yet I see the numbers tick up every day uh, in terms of death counts, you know, for me here in San Diego, as well as around the world. And I realize enough, and I guess that's, that's the compassion, the empathy that I can have is every one of those numbers is a human being. And whereas others tend to just see it as a data point that they may or may not even see, but I agree. I, I, I think there is that. In fact, it was interesting to sort of build on that is I've been paying attention. I like to research and I find the kind of research sites and uh, there was one yesterday I was listening to the video of a recording from the key person on vaccines he's South uh, Korea um, speaks incredibly great English and, and of course you know sort of they really handle the, the thing very well right in the beginning and they were asked really for him to recount you know reflections on this and that is a lot combined with another site. And again, I started to see these parallels of these really key people who know. And, you know, so what they said is, is that, yes, we're, we're moving fast to get the vaccines, but we, there's a lot of uncertainty that we can't address at this time, how effective they will be, how long they will last, you know, and then it comes the comment is, is that, that this is, this is a very different than a flu or anything else as, as we heard comments really out up front. And that we're already seeing the mutations and so far we're starting to see is it's okay. You know, there's a, a sense that, that the vaccines are gonna work with the various mutations that have come out. But really what I learned from these different talks was a reference to the fact is one said is, is but this is the warm up. They said, this is the warm up. This is, this is just allowing us and the hope is, is that we learn from this to be able to prepare for what's really coming. And here's scientists, right? Here's things there. And yet speaking a similar language that I've been feeling in my heart and, you know, thinking about what's forward. So I appreciate it. So anyways, it's just, it's my own quick reaction uh, to this is first of all, again, gratitude for your willingness to really share and really how you brought it to very 
relevant to, to, to current times and, and a story well needed. Tom, thoughts? Yeah, um, I, I think I remember Tom talking about this in Sedona when, when I was in one of the trips up on the hill um, overlooking the canyon or a canyon. And at the time, you know, it's, it's felt like there was almost a sense of gloom about it, you know, whoa, this could happen. And, and those of us um, maybe on that trip or in, in around that time, because this probably coincides with the time when we were talking about the blue light yeah, or had finished talking about it, or isn't there something we can do? You know, maybe, maybe this isn't the final, maybe, maybe there is some hope, maybe, you know, we can pull it together or whatever. Um, not wanting to give up on that. Um, but one of the things that, that occurs to me is that there's a sense of gloom and pessimism among certain Christian doctrines, let's just say, without being too judgmental about that, um, that the Armageddon uh, is approaching and there's nothing we can do about it, right. you know? And that this is all part of the plan that there's going to be an end to the earth and that and that this is, you know, so why, you know, why bother in, in some sense? Um, it, and, and that belief system, I think, is driving a lot of this, whether it's conscious or not. I think there's a driving force of um, fatalism that is is in the mix. Whereas we tend, or you know, I say we, the, those uh, that I know in the priesthood and with, with um, the group has sort of been involved with um, Tom over the years and so forth, have always felt a sense of what can we do? You know, how can, how can we alter this or how can we enhance our situation so that we don't have to go through these things? Um, we can survive or we can not only that, but enhance the whole condition, human condition, so that we thrive. Um, and that we, so that the, what is it, third or two thirds? Was it a third that would be? Oh, one quarter would be left. One quarter. Yeah. yeah. And, th and that's been that's a kind of a, a rough estimate, you know, a theme of, of that whole Armageddon sort of thing, the 144,000 kind of image of so many people would find, would be saved, and then that that group would then propagate and go on with, you know, keep keeping the sanity of the earth and keeping sanctity of the earth. Uh, just wondering how much of all of that uh, is clouding the image of well we're going to be saved anyway you know that's that's what i see is the problem is that that generalized sense of i got my ticket to be saved right and not having compassion for the others mm -hmm. that's that's the where it falls apart i mean you you the basic human compassion for everyone whether you to just put up that wall of I'm good and you had your cho chance. That's cold. That's yeah, just too that cold. I can't, I don't shows like that. the individualism, in, you know, of people today, right? You it's know, entitlement, it's just, you know, entitlement, yeah. better word, better word. And, you know, what's great is, is, you know, the theme, the ripple effect and, and the impact, you know, that Tom has had is a great example and there relates to it reminds me all of a sudden of a uh, time I was sitting there he had a few people over which I, who knows you might have been there as well and and because he wanted us to watch this documentary and I'm not good at remembering the the, the country of names but it was this first area I believe it was in South America um, that had been closed off to people for, you know, I, for, I don't know, long time, whatever. You, yeah. you may know more, Richard, you know, of that too. But the essence of it is, is they let them in and only to find out and realize that their territory, their land was the equivalent of the, of the different land masses, land groups, the desert, the oceans, the water. 
And what they were able to see there was the beginnings of it being tainted, of it being destroyed. And of course it went beyond that because it had talked about, you know, how the, they had people who were selected to be their senseis or spiritual leaders, whatever they had called them. And they would have them go into a cave for a number of years. So they actually be blind coming out, but they would, well, their can, vision can I, was awesome. Can so, I yeah. fill in? Can I yes. fill in a little bit? I, I'm trying hard to remember the name of the, the, the group of people, the tribe. It seems like it starts with a G or a G like sound, but they lived in a, in a curved section of the, uh, along the coast of South America from the, um, from the, the sea, from sea level up to 10, 12,000 feet. And it was inaccessible except by one bridge. They, and they, they stayed there, closed themselves off as the Tibetans did for so long with the understanding that they have to keep themselves closed. They called the rest of the world little brother. And they talked about it in terms of little brother left us. And now the, what, what little brother is doing is affecting the world. So they had a microcosm of the earth in all these uh, the elevation changes and this huge bowl like the uh, area they lived in and the glaciers at the top were gave the water for the rest of the for everyone to for the rest of the downhill area to live on and those glaciers started shrinking that's when they let one particular filmmaker in they, they how they managed to find exactly the right guy is, is a, a, astonishing. But he had the heart to not just go in and go, oh, you live like this? Oh, look at that. But, da, but he had the heart to be moved and to make this film uh, the way that it, it should be made, to, to try and get this across to people that we are hurting our chances of survival on the earth. And you can see it in that microcosm of how uh, they live. Man, I'm so close to getting the, the name of the tribe. Uh, but it fits in uh, to get a little esoteric. It fits in, they called the rest of the world little brother and that little brother separated from them. That do we have time? Yeah. <laughs> that leads into an understanding of the, of the story of the Tower of Babylon. Typically, the story of the Tower of Babylon is these people were going to build a tower to God, you know, and just build it tall enough to be able to finally reach God. God didn't like it, so he made them all speak different languages, and they had to walk away that's a very surface view of it i suspect that the story is trying to teach that there previously was a more universal method of communication more universal sense of communication that was more heartfelt that people could and I've done this with people I've loved to, to just know, oh my goodness, so-and-so's in trouble somehow. You'll, there's a, like millions of anecdotes of things like that, that they, you have to go and get someone or you show someone, or there's minor little connections. My sense is that that was a common thing to have among, among people worldwide. But when people got too attached to material things, when they got too caught up in a, a hierarchy of, you know, who's the king, who's the servant, who's the in between the king, who's the mid between them, but, 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 but so I'm better than you, you're better, you're below. I'm, but when that stuff get, comes in, it just shatters that honest, we're all together feeling. And as I offered that to Tom and he said, 
Yep, that's essentially what happened, and it was in a, and it centered around Babylon, not the present day Babylon, but the original location, which uh, has been found through uh, satellite imagery to be somewhere different than the original uh, the, the original tracks of the Tigris and Euphrates River uh, had moved. So the original Babylon is where that began, that sense of um, fascination or attachment to uh, management, government, hierarchy, kings, gold, material, the, the external power stru structures that we see so much of uh, in our world today. I, that I, got in the way of the connection. When, um, during, at the beginning of the COVID, I, I was, one of the things that I did was go through my old videos that I had taken with Tom over the years, the different ah. lectures, sitting at his feet, you know, with the, with the video camera, <laughs> yeah. focused on him, you know. And so I started to review those. And one of the things he mentioned was Rudolf Steiner yeah. and his material and said that if, you know, if you can get through the process of how he writes yep. and, and the, the way that he writes and go to, and he was explaining what to watch for in, in his, uh, in his writing and what to focus on. The first, it was written in like three different parts or something, you know, he would yeah. in the background and, and then the kernel would be in the middle and then there would be some follow up. So I started trying to do that because I wouldn't, I have tried to read him before and never got very far mm -hmm. um, with the, the whole, um, just because of that, it's very complex. But he talked about the, in the writings that he did, he talked about how we started out and, and this particular book was on Egyptian mythology and um, how we relate to the Egyptians. And our time is directly related to the time when, when we went to Egypt during our, our back in the 90s. 91. In the 80s and 90s. Um, we were reconnecting with our roots because yeah. there is a direct connection between that time and now spiritually and um one of the things that was talked about was this idea of devolving from where we were we were as you described very much more intuitive and very much more um empathetic and um all of these sensory experiences naturally connected have to, and less physical really yes uh and that we are becoming more and more gross and more and more yeah. physical and so we're we're at a at a point now where as you say we're we're really we're hardening you know we don't have the those um connections of empathy and intuition and well some of us do but the world in general is becoming more and more physically attached and more and more physical yeah and so really i see that 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 the disease or the COVID or the whatever is a physical manifestation of, you know, it's like, okay, you're, you're going to pay attention. You're going to change, <laughs> you know, I don't exactly. care whether you believe it or not, you know, this is going to happen. We're in control now, you know, this, this right. energy is forcing um, the, the people to have to and, and you know I, I keep thinking well maybe these people that are running around with no masks they'll get sick right and 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 they'll get their uppets you know it's well you okay go ahead do that you're going to get really sick you know and they do and they don't you know i mean some people yep. do and some don't and it's um but there's a sense in which that we're we're at a turning point with with our like Mike and I were talking about all these buildings. I think the didn't we talk about the empty um, office buildings? Yep. Are people going to go back to work in all these high rises in the cities? What's going to happen to cities? What's going to happen to the whole infrastructure of of everything? If everybody wants to work at home and they can, you have all these crazy um, you know 
dead cities are down. Yeah. There's a lot of change. Yeah. And and um, so I, I can see this whole, the, the, you know, whether we've reached the bottom or that or not, or, you know, but it's a matter of turning, turning around, you know, I mean, and I think a number of us are, are aware of this um, and have been aware of it and certainly would want and, and want to try to help people uh, in whatever creative ways we can access. And I remember Mayor Baba, uh, we had this conversation some time ago when I was talking about my experience in, in Myrtle Beach, uh, talked about the movie industry as being potentially um, the new vehicle for spiritual awakening. Mm -hmm. uh, this was back in the 50s, you know, um, when he right. was talking about this, when he was very much in, in uh, interested in movies and the movie stars and a lot of them came to him um, but finding the ways of Mike you know you're doing these I mean how many of us are watching this you know I mean like uh, I count two <laughs> <laughs> we can count them right on our fingers uh, so how do we get this out there you know how, how do we yeah. message what's what's um what awareness needs to take place what shift of awareness needs to take place and how how to um not just find a vaccine and go back to work you know i don't think that that's, that's going to take care of everything i've gotten my shots i've gotten both of them now um and my the two people i work with have gotten their first ones so there's a sense of relief uh, on one hand you know but as you say the, the next round who knows what, you know, whether it's really going to work or if it's just going to keep us, uh, there's a, a sense of relief. And then it's like, oh, well, maybe not, you know. Uh, but on the other hand, if everybody just cooperated, it yeah. would go away. Yeah. Wear the mask, you know, don't go out for however many months. As It'll New die Zealand, out. As New Zealand has shown. It's like I used to say to people, "There's a cure for AIDS. You can we can get you can get rid of AIDS completely in one generation with monogamy. But nobody wants to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just. Uh, uh, but to, uh, to say, hey, excuse me, but along your point of, uh, if you don't learn now, one of the things that Tom. Excuse, one of the things that Tom said in one of the talks, when someone was asking him, trying to get from him what he had been shown in his near-death experience was uh, a possibility uh, for a human future. And he teared up just a little bit and said, what happens in a city when the toilets don't flush? And there you got to imagine the electricity is gone. There's no water being driven anywhere. The, the, the sewage piles up the, the, you know, there's, there's no light. Just keep come, follow that out. What does that mean as you keep going and going and going and going all the uh, implications of that? We can learn our lesson anytime we're willing to. I appreciate the comments because my thought is, is, you know, just along the lines of, you know, what can we do? And I think we are, we're doing it. I know I yeah. asked myself this a million times is, you know, I could say that this was really this whole concept, which you and I talked about. It. I think we talked about it when the, first, the band first got back together. This was, I would call it spiritually inspired, you know, this is the idea This is something I do and yeah. And to do it and 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 that's you know my little way of being able to listen to that quiet voice inside and 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 really to me is just along the lines is just okay well what do i do from here we're recording what do i do and just to trust and what i can say is is that you know that i'm not in this for the numbers or the ratings or whatever but the trust 
you know, was a confirmation of that is, is just all of a sudden, one day I started to look in there and, and the numbers were going up next week, up, up, and I'm not doing anything. You know, I just did, I, I just did this. <laughs> and then, then along came, you know, this little sense, this is that, uh, so it's a podcast. Why don't you start reading this podcast? But it's another popular way to do that. So I looked into it and did it. I'm starting to record things on consciousness, on the stories of Tom Sawyer. You know, Richard, I think you saw some of those in posts. And I've also just yep. been pod putting, putting those in podcasts. Simple little thing to do. And that now has its own little angle of which it's working or whatever. And as long as I just sort of leave it up to whatever. You know, I just need to go and keep using, as I've been inspired to do, the gift of being able to write, you know, and then be able to record these in ways of which people are reviewing it today and see what happens. And, you know, I, I think and for my own self, this is one of the things is I've been listening to a lot of near-death experiences, tell us stories recently. It's just been a great refresher to yeah. the times of Tom uh, and just to hear, you know, all these variations of the truth, or as I would say, you know, to what, what's been realized. And, and I, Bruce, Gre Bruce Grayson? Grayson. Yeah, pronounce Grayson, thank you. You know, he's been now on the stage again with a lot more things. I think it's with his book, new book, After Out. He's been in the forefront sharing a lot at some of the IANS conferences and others. You know, in terms of the research of this too, and it's fascinating, the data now, which is what's been needed to reach to the scientific communities, the doctor communities, uh, to be able to influence them because they saw this as something warm and fuzzy. But it's reaching, it's, an, it's starting to impact. And along with that has been the number of doctors that have had near-death experiences and they're now telling their story. And so I, I, I think that that's, along with all little things, you know, our little step here is, is to attempt to really get the story out, to really share the thoughts of what's happening with an idea or hope of influencing others, but a belief that we have that it will do whatever it's intended to do, you know, as well as to really grow and maintain compassion and empathy in everything we do. It's so easy to hate out there today. It's just so easy. Yeah. And I have to remind myself at that time because I just see that every day with the flaunting and not wearing a mask, the arrogancy, the entitlement, as, as Tom said, and my initial reaction is anger. And then I have to pull myself back and sort of remind myself is, is uh, well, I don't want to add a negative energy to what's already negative. I can just send a love to the situation and see what happens. But got a few more minutes, I just have dinner cooking. So I just wanna wrap it up. My final part is just the gratitude Richard for bringing us on, please. Tom, I think you've got some great insights, stories. I'd love to, to get you back on. I think that this is just a forum of at least one for now. Um, that we can begin to start capturing the things that are residing in your head. And Richard, you were inspired and this was awesome. So thank you. You're very welcome. It's a yeah, treat, thank you. Treat to be able to do, thank you. You came along at the right time, man. Oh, it's been terrific. So truly, yeah. And, and said, so Thomas, you've got those videos and as you're watching them, if you can come up with, you know, anything else that sparks an interest to, you know, to, to share as Richard did tonight, you know, please do. I, I think the world of you guys and, and pass it on to anybody else too, right? You know, as Richard, the group, you know, anybody else there too, that that's in so inspired, you know, let's, let's just, uh, get a chance to, to record and share it, see what happens. You got it. Amen. You're going to leave, leave on, a, uh, on, on an uplifted note. I have a dumb joke. <laughs> What's faster, hot or cold? You got me. Hot is faster because you can catch a cold. Uh... <laughs> Yeah. Now people will want to get off this thing. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> if I could reach over there and just slap you. There we are. <laughs> no, no, that was awesome. Well, is that <laughs> snow behind you, Richard? And it, Michael, that's warm behind you. That's hot there, right? So yeah, it's, uh, yeah, uh, that's... I'll, I'll go for the hot part. Yeah, I'll I go over this, there. <laughs> yeah, I took this picture just a, a week ago. <laughs> It's worse out there now. There's been we've had more snow and more cold since. Yeah. <laughs>